you. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Testing one, two, three. Um, thank you for joining me today here in this wonderful museum for a uh, selected reading of the 1961 English translation by Jonathan Griffin of the first manuscript of Paul Gauguin's Noah Noah. Let's see. For 63 days I've been on my way, and I burned to reach the longed-for land. On June 8th, we saw strange fires moving about in zigzags, fishermen. Against the dark sky, a jagged black cone stood out. We were rounding Morea and coming inside of Tahiti. A few hours later, the dawn twilight became visible, and slowly we approached the reefs of Tahiti then entered the fairway and anchored without mishap in the roads. To a man who has traveled a good deal, this small island is not, like the Bay of Rio de Janeiro, a magic sight. A few peaks of sub-mountain after the deluge, a family climbed up there, took root. The corals also climbed. They ringed round the new island. At 10 in the morning, I called on Governor La Cascade, who received me as a man of consequence entrusted by the government with a mission, ostensibly artistic, but mainly consisting in political spying. I did all I could to undeceive the political people. It was no good. They thought I was paid. I assured them I was not. Having only just arrived, rather disappointed as I was by things being so far from what I had longed for and this was the point imagined, disgusted as I was by all this European triviality. I was sad, coming so far to... Shall I manage to recover any trace of that past, so remote and so mysterious? And the present had nothing worthwhile to say to me, to get back to the ancient hearth, revive the fire in the midst of all these ashes, and for that, quite alone, without any support. Cast down though I am, I am not in the habit of giving up without having tried everything, the impossible as well as the possible. My mind was soon made up to leave Papita as quickly as I could, to get away from the European center. I had a sort of vague presentiment that by living wholly in the bush with natives of Tahiti, I would manage with patience to overcome these people's mistrust and that I would know. An officer of the gendarmerie graciously offered me his carriage and his horse. I left one morning in search of my hut. My vahine went with me. Titi was her name. Almost an English girl, but she spoke a little French. That day she had put on her best dress, a flower behind her ear, and her sugarcane hat, which she had plaited, was adorned above its ribbon of straw flowers with a trimming of orange-colored shells. Her black hair hung loose over her shoulders. Like this, she looked really pretty. She was proud of being in a carriage. She was proud of being well-dressed. She was proud of being the vahine of a man she believed to be important and highly paid. All this pride had nothing absurd about it. Solo adjusted is their cast of features for wearing dignity ancient memories of great chieftains, a race that has had such a futile past. I well knew that all her mercenary love was composed merely of things that, in our European eyes, make a whore. But to one observer, there was more than this. Such eyes and such a mouth could not lie. There is in all of them a love so innate that whether mercenary or not mercenary, it is still love. Besides, I... At noon, we reached the 45th kilometer, the Mataea district. I visited the district and in the end found rather a fine hut, 
which the owner consented to let me. He would build another one next door to live in. On our way back next day in the evening, Titi asked me if I would agree to take her with me later, in a few days, when I've moved in. I realized that this half-white girl, glossy from contact with all those Europeans, would not fulfill the aim I had set before me. I shall find them by the dozen, I said to myself. But the country is not the town. And besides, is it necessary to take them in the Maori fashion, Mao Saisis? And I did not know their languages. The few young girls in Matea who do not live with a Tane, man, look at you with such frankness, utterly fearless dignity, that I was really intimidated. Also, it was said that many of them were sick of that sickness which the civilized Europeans have brought them in return for their generous hospitality. After a little while, I let Titi know that I would be happy if she would return. And yet in Papite, she had a terrible reputation. She had buried several lovers in succession. Description, landscape, shoreside, picture of the woodcutter, inland, the mango seen against the mountain, over the entrance to the impressive cave. I went that evening to smoke a cigarette on the sands by the seashore. The sun was rapidly approaching the horizon, was beginning to hide behind the Isle of Morea, which I had on my right. Against its light, the mountain stood out in strong black upon the blazing sky. Night came quickly. This time again, Morea was asleep. I fell asleep later in my bed silence of a Tahitian night. Only the beating of my heart could be heard. The reeds of my hut and their spaced rows were visible from my bed with the moonlight filtering through them like an instrument of music. Pipo, our ancestors called it. Vivo is their name for it. But silent, it speaks at night through memories. I fell asleep to that music. Above me, the great high roof of screw pine leaves the lizards dwell there. In my sleep, I could imagine space above my head, the vault of heaven, not a prison in which one stifles. My hut was space, freedom. After two days, I had exhausted my provisions. I had imagined that with money, I would find all that is necessary for nourishment. The food is there, certainly on the trees, on the mountain slopes, in the sea. But one has to be able to climb a high tree, to go up the mountain and come back laden with heavy burdens, to be able to catch the fish, dive and tear from the sea bottom the shells firmly attached to the rocks. So there I was, a civilized man, for the time being definitely inferior to the savage. And as on an empty stomach, I was pondering sadly on my, con on, uh, pondering sadly on my situation, a native made signs to me and shouted in his language, come and eat. I understood, but I was ashamed and shaking my head refused. A few minutes later, a child silently laid at the side of my door some food cleanly done up in freshly picked leaves then withdrew. I was hungry, so silently I accepted. A little later, the man went by and with a kindly expression, without stopping, said to me a single word, Baya. I understood vaguely, are you satisfied? On the ground under some clusters of broad pumpkin leaves, I caught sight of a small dark head with quiet eyes. A little child was examining me, then made off timorously when its eyes met mine. These black people, these cannibal teeth, brought the word savages into my mouth. For them, too, I was the savage, rightly, perhaps. I began to work, notes, sketches of all kinds. Everything in the landscape blinded me, dazzled me. Coming from Europe, I was constantly uncertain of some color, beating about the bush, and yet it was so simple to put naturally onto my canvas a red and a blue in the brooks, forms of gold enchanted me. Why did I hesitate to pour that gold and all that rejoicing of the sunshine onto my canvas? Old habits from Europe, probably. All this timidity of expression of our bastardized races. 
to initiate myself properly into the character of a Tahitian face, into all the charm of a Maori smile. I had long wanted to make a portrait of a woman who lived close by, who was of true Tahitian descent. I asked her permission one day when she had plucked up the courage to come into my hut and look at some pho photographs of paintings. She looked with particular interest at a photograph of Manet's Olympia. With the words I had already learned in that language, for two months I had not spoken a word of French, I questioned her. She told me this Olympia was truly beautiful. I smiled at that opinion and was moved by it. She had the sense of the beautiful, and the Ecole des Beaux-Arts considers that picture horrible. She added all of a sudden, break the silence that presides over a thought, it's your wife. Yes, I lied, me the Tane of Olympia. <laughs> I asked if I might paint her portrait. Aita, no. She said in a tone almost of rage and went away. This refusal really depressed me. An hour later, she came back in a beautiful dress, caprice, desire for the forbidden fruit. She smelled good, she was adorned, and I worked with haste. I suspected that this decision was not firm. Portrait of a woman, Bahina Nete Tiare. A period of work alone. I saw plenty of calm eyed young women. I wanted them to be willing to be taken without a word, taken brutally, in a way, a longing to rape. The old man said to me, speaking of one of them, now, Tara, take this one. I was timid and dared not, res my, I was timid and dared not resign myself to the effort. I let Titi know that I wanted her to come. She came, but being already civilized, used to an official's luxury, she did not suit me for long. I parted from her. Alone again. I became each day a little more savage. My neighbors were almost my friends, dressed like them, fed like them. In the evening, I would go to the house where the natives from round about me met. Every day gets better for me. In the end, I understand the language quite well. My neighbors, three close by, the others at various distances, regard me almost as one of themselves. My naked feet, my daily contact with the rock have got used to the ground. My body, almost always naked, no longer fears the sun. Civilization leaves me bit by bit, and I begin to think simply, to have only a little hatred for my neighbor, and I function in an animal way, freely, with the certainty of the morrow. Like today, every morning the sun rises serene for me as for everyone. I become carefree and calm and loving. I have a natural friend who has come to see me every day naturally without any interested motive. My paintings in color, my wood carvings astonished him and my answers to his questions taught him something. Not a day when I work, but he comes to watch me. One day when handing him my tools, I asked him to try a sculpture. He gazed at me in amazement and said to me simply with sincerity that I was not like other men. And he was perhaps the first of my fellows to tell me that I was useful to others. A child, one has to be, to think that an artist is something useful. The young man was faultlessly handsome and we were great friends. Sometimes in, the evening when I was sometimes in the evening when I was resting from my day's work, he would ask me the questions of a young savage who wants to know a lot of things about love in Europe, questions which often embarrassed me. One day I wished to have for sculpture a tree of rosewood, a piece of considerable size and not hollow. For that, he told me, you must go up the mountain to a certain place where I know several fine trees that might satisfy you. If you like, I'll take you there and we'll carry it back, the two of us. We left in the early morning. We went naked, both of us, except for the loincloth and ax in hand, crossing the river many a time to take advantage of a bit of track which my companion seemed to smell out, 
so little visible, so deeply shaded, complete silence, only the noise of water crying against rock, monotonous as the silence. And two we certainly were, two friends, he a quite young man, and I almost an old man in body and soul, in civilized vices, in lost illusions. His live, animal body had graceful contours. He walked in front of me, sexless. From all this youth, from this perfect harmony with the nature which surrounded us, there emanated a beauty, a fragrance, Noah Noah, that enchanted my artist soul. From this friendship so well cemented by the mutual attraction between simple and composite, love took power to blossom in me, and we were only the two of us. I had a sort of presentiment of crime, the desire for the unknown, the awakening of evil, and weariness of the male role, having always to be strong, protective, shoulders that are a heavy load, to be for a minute the weak being who loves and obeys. I drew close, without fear of laws, my temples throbbing. The path had come to an end. We had to cross the river. My companion turned at that moment so that his chest was towards me. The hermaphrodite had vanished. It was a young man after all. His innocent eyes resembled the limpidity of the water. Calm suddenly came back into my soul, and this time I enjoyed the coolness of the stream deliciously, plunging into it with delight. Toe, toe, he said to me, it's cold. Oh, no, I answered. And this denial, answering my previous desire, drove in among the cliffs like an echo. Fiercely, I thrust my way with energy into the thicket, become more and more wild. The boy went on his way, stimple, still limpid-eyed. He had not understood. I alone carried the burden of an evil thought. A whole civilization had been before me in evil and had educated me. We were reaching our destination. At that point, the crags of the mountain drew apart, and behind a curtain of tangled trees, a semblance of a plateau, hidden but not unknown, there, several trees, rosewood, extended their huge branches. Savages, both of us, we attacked with the ax a magnificent tree which had to be destroyed to get a branch suitable to my desires. I struck furiously, and my hands, covered with blood, hacked away with the pleasure of sating one's brutality and of destroying something. In time, with the noise of the ax, I sang, cut down by the foot the whole forest of desires. Cut down in yourself the love of yourself, as a man would cut down with his hand in the autumn the lotus. Well, and truly destroyed indeed all the old remnant of civilized man in me. I returned at peace, feeling myself thenceforward a different man, a Maori. The two of us carried our heavy load cheerfully, and I could again admire in front of me the graceful curves of my young friend, and calmly, curves robust like the tree we were carrying. The tree smelt of roses, Noah Noah. We got back in the afternoon tired. He said to me, are you pleased? Yes. And inside myself, I repeated, yes. I was definitely at peace from then on. I gave not a single blow of the chisel to that piece of wood without having memories of a sweet quietude, a fragrance, a victory, and a rejuvenation. The center of the island. Many people had spoken to me of it, and I had conceived the plan of spending some days there alone. But what will you do at night? You'll be tormented by the Tupapawa, spirits of the dead. Disturb the spirits of the mountains. You must be mad, you must be mad and reckless to go and disturb the spirits of the mountains. All this was just what was needed to excite my curiosity. 
And so one fine morning I set out. For nearly two hours I followed a path along one bank of the Punaru. Then I crossed the stream again and again. On either side of the walls became more and more steep, enormous rocks in the stream. I had to continue my journey almost all the time in the river, with the water sometimes up to my knees, sometimes to my shoulders. Between two excessively high walls, the sunshine hardly thrust in at all. The sky blew, you could almost see the stars in full daytime. Nine o'clock, the, di the daylight was failing, and I could began at last to wonder where I should spend the night. When I noticed to one side an acre or two of nearly flat ground were bracken, wild banana trees, and barrows, pell-mell, luckily some ripe bananas. Hastily I made a fire, baked bananas my meal, and I settled down as best I could at the foot of a tree whose branches across which I had entwined some banana leaves would give me shelter if it rained. I was cold. I was soaked from wading all day in cold water. I slept badly. I was afraid wild boar might come and take the skin off my legs, so I slipped the cord of my axe over my wrist. Black night. Next day, at dawn, I left and continued on my way. Wilder and wilder, the river turned more and more to rapids, twisting more and more. Huge crayfish eyed me, seeming to say, what have you come here for? Who are you, age-old eels? Often I was obliged to climb, swinging from branch to branch, reaching a detour. What I saw, a description of the picture of Pape Moy. I had made no sound. When she had finished drinking, she took water in her hands and poured it over her breasts. Then, as an uneasy antelope instinctively senses a stranger, she gazed hard at the thicket where I was hidden. Violently, she dived, crying out the word, Take, fierce. I rushed to look down into the water, vanished. Only a huge eel writhed between the small stones of the bottom. Arrival near Orai, legend of Te Fato. For some time, I had been depressed. My work was suffering. I was short of many documents. It is true I had been divorced for some months. I was no longer forced to hear that babble of Ahine always asking me questions about the same things and myself answering invariably with the same refrain. I decided to go off for a time on a journey round the island. Leaving the coast road, I plunge into a thicket that leads far into the mountains, arrive at a small valley. Several people live there and want to go on living in the old way. Description of the picture of Matamua autrefois and of Hina Maruru. I move on, arrive to Tarabaru, far end of the island. The gendarme lends me his horse. I ride along the east coast, not much frequented by Europeans. Arrived at Faone, the small district that comes before that of Itia, a native hails me, a man who makes men. He knows that I am a painter. Come and eat with us. The phrase of welcome. I do not need to be asked twice. His face so gentle. I dismount from the horse. He takes it and ties it to a branch without any servility, simply and efficiently. I go into a house where several men, women, and children are gathered, sitting on the ground, chatting and smoking. Where are you going, says a fine Maori woman of about 40. I'm going to Atia. What for? An idea passed through my brain. I answered, to look for a wife. Atia has plenty and pretty ones. Do you want one? Yes. If you like, I'll give you one. She's my daughter. Is she young? Aye. Is she pretty? Aye. Good. Go and fetch her for me. She went away for a quarter of an hour. And as they brought the Maori meal of wild bananas and some crayfish, the old woman returned, followed by a tall young girl carrying a small parcel. Through her excessively transparent dress of pink muslin, the golden skin of her shoulders and arms could be seen. Two nipples thrust out firmly from her chest. Her charming face appeared to me different from the others I had seen on the island up to the present, and her bushy hair was slightly crinkled. In the sunshine, an orgy of chrome yellows. I found out that she was of Tongan origin. 
When she had sat down beside me, I asked her some questions. You aren't afraid of me. I eat them, no. Would you like to live always in my hut? Hey, uh, you've never been ill. I eat her. That was all. And my heart throbbed as impassively she laid out on the ground before me on a large banana leaf the food that was offered me. Though hungry, I ate timidly. That girl, a child of about 13, enchanted me and scared me. What was going on in her soul? I had this contract so hastily thought of and signed. I felt a shy hesitation about the signing. I, nearly an old man, perhaps the mother had ordered it with her mind on money. And yet in that tall child, the independent pride of all that race, the serenity of a thing deserving praise, the mocking, though tender lips showed clearly that the danger was for me, not for her. I left the hut. I will not say without fear, took my horse and mounted. The girl followed behind. The mother, a man and two young women, her aunts, she said, followed also. We took the road back to Taraval, nine kilometers from Faune. After a kilometer, I was told, Pare, Tie, stop here. I dismounted and entered a large hut, well kept and smelling almost opulent. The opulence of the wealth of the earth. Pretty mats on the ground on top of straw. A family quite young and as gracious, gracious as could be lived there. And the girl sat down next to her mother, whom she introduced to me. A silence. Cool water, which we drank in turn like a libation. And the young mother said to me with tears in her eyes, Are you kind? When I had examined my conscience, I answered uneasily, Yes. Will you make my daughter happy? Yes. In eight days, let her come back. If she is not happy, she will leave you. A long silence. We emerged, and again I moved off on horseback. They followed behind. On the road, we met several people. Well, well, you're the vahine of a Frenchman now, are you? Be happy. Good luck. That, mother, that, that matter of two mothers worried me. I asked the old woman who had offered me her daughter, why did you tell me a lie? Tehamana's mother, that was my wife's name, answered, the other is also her mother, her nursing mother. We reached Taraval. I gave the gendarme back his horse. His wife, a French woman, said to me, not indeed maliciously, but tactlessly, what, have you brought back a trollop with you? And her eyes undressed the impassive girl, now grown haughty. Decrepitude was staring at the new flowering. The virtue of the law was breathing impurely upon the native, but pure unashamedness of trust, faith. And against that so blue sky, I saw with grief this dirty cloud of smoke. I felt ashamed of my race, and my eyes turned away from that mud. Quickly, I forgot it, to gaze upon this gold which I already I loved. I remember that. The family farewells took place at Taravao at the house of the Chinese who there deals in everything, men and beasts. My fiance and I took the public my fiance and I took the public carriage, which brought us to Matea, twenty-five kilometers from there. My home. My new wife was not very talkative. She was melancholy and ironic. We observed each other. She was impenetrable. I was quickly beaten in that struggle. In spite of all my inward resolutions, my nerves rapidly got the upper hand, and I was soon, for her, an open book. Maori character yields, only, <coughs> Maori character yields itself only in time. French character. A week went by, during which I was childish to a point that surprised me. I loved her and I told her so, which made her smile. She knew it perfectly well. She seemed to love me and never told me so. Sometimes at night, flashes of light played across Tehamana's golden skin. That was all. It was a great deal. 
That week, swift as a day, as an hour was over, she asked me to let her go and see her mother at Fione. I had promised. She left, and sadly I put her in the public carriage with a few piastres in her handkerchief to pay the fare and give her father some rum. To me it seemed a goodbye. Would she come back? Several days later, she came back. I set to work again, and happiness succeeded to happiness. Every day at the first ray of sunlight, the light was radiant in my room. The gold of Tehamana's face flooded all about it, and the two of us would go naturally, simply, as in paradise, to refresh ourselves in a nearby stream. The life of every day. Tehamana yields herself daily more and more, docile and loving. The Tahitian Noah Noah pervades the whole of me. I am no longer conscious of the days and hours, of good and of evil. All is beautiful. All is well. Instinctively, when I am working, when I am meditating, Tehamana keeps silence. She always knows when to speak to me without disturbing me. Conversations about what happens in Europe, about God, about the gods. She learns from me. I learn from her. In bed at nightfall, conversations. One day I had to go to Papite. I had promised to come back that same evening. On the way back, the carriage broke down halfway. I had to do the rest on foot. It was one in the morning when I got home. Having at that moment very little oil in the house, my stock was due to be replenished. The lamp had gone out, and the room was in darkness when I went in. I felt afraid and more still mistrustful. Surely the bird has flown. I struck matches and saw on the bed. Description of the picture. Tupapau. The poor child came to herself again, and I did all I could to restore her confidence. Never leave me alone again like this without light. What have you been doing in town? You've been to see women, the kind who go to market to drink and dance, then give themselves to the officers, to the sailors, to everybody. I was invited to a wedding, a real legal wedding, which the missionaries have tried to impose on Christian converts. On the appointed day, the local schoolmistress, a girl who is almost white, was marrying a real husband, a real Maori, the son of the chieftain of Puna Ua Uia. The girl had been at the church schools at Papit, and the Protestant bishop, who was taking an interest in her, had insisted urgently on her marriage to the young chieftain. In those parts, missionaries' will is will of God. When everyone has eaten and drunk a great deal for an hour or so, the many speeches are delivered with order and method, eloquence, surprise. Which of the two families is to give the bride a new name is an important question. Often, indeed, the argument becomes almost a fight. There was nothing of that kind that day. All was calm. Everyone was happy, gay, and pretty drunk. My poor Vahine led on, was calm, I'm sorry, my poor Vahine, led on by some of the other girls, I was not keeping an eye on her, emerged dead drunk, and I had trouble in getting her home. Very charming, but very heavy. <laughs> in the place of honor at the table, the admirably dignified wife of the chieftain of Puna Uya, clad in an orange velvet dress, a pretentious, strange costume, very like those you see at a fair. And yet the inborn grace of that people, her consciousness of her rank, made all that fancy dress beautiful. In the midst of all those flowers and Tahitian dishes, her fragrance was one more, Noah Noah. Next to her sat a centenarian relative, a death mask, made yet more terrible by the intact double row of her cannibal teeth. Tattooed on her cheek, an indistinct dark mark, a shape like a letter, I had already seen tattoo marks, but not like that one, which was certainly European. I was told that formerly the missionaries had raged against indulgent and had branded some of the women on the cheek as a warning against hell, a thing which covered them with shame, not shame for any sin committed, but the ridicule of a distinctive mark. 
When I heard that, I understood the present-day Maui's mistrust of Europeans. Years have gone by between the old woman being marked by the priest and the girl being married by the priest. The mark is still there. Five months later, the bride gave birth to a well-formed child. Fury of the relatives who demanded a separation. The young man would have none of it. Since we love each other, what does it matter? It's one of our customs to adopt other people's children. I adopt this one. But why did the bishop take such trouble to hurry on the legal marriage? Evil tongues insinuated that. We prefer to believe in the angel of the Annunciation. <laughs> Tunny fishing. For about a fortnight, the flies, rare till then, had been appearing in swarms and becoming unbearable, and all the Maoris rejoiced. The bonitos and tunny fish would come in from the open sea and set to work checking the strength of their lines and hooks. Women and children all lent a hand at dragging nets or rather long fences of coconut leaves along the shore and over the coral rocks that formed the bottom of the water between the land and the reefs. This to catch a small fish of which the tunnies are fond. The day came when two large pirogues were launched in the sea, coupled together and bearing at the prow by a very long rod that could be swiftly raised by two ropes stretching to the stern. By this means, when the fish is bitten, it is at once raised and brought aboard. We passed between the reefs and moved well out into the open sea. A turtle gazed at us going by. We reach a place where the sea is very deep, known as the Tunny Hole. It is to where they come to sleep at night, very deep down, out of the reach of the sharks. A cloud of seabirds watch the tunny. When these come right to the surface, they drop to sea level and rise again with a strip of flesh in their beak. Carnage on all sides. When I asked why a long line was, was not let down into the tunny hole, I was told that it was a sacred place, the abode of the god of the sea. A man was chosen by the captain of the boat to cast the hook clear of the pirogue. Time passed. Not a tunny would bite. Another man was called. This time a superb fish bit. It made the rod bend. Four sturdy arms raised the stem, and with the tugging of the ropes from astern, the tunny was just being brought to the surface. A shark pounced on his prey. A few slashes of its teeth, and all we got into the boat was a head. The fishing was starting badly. My turn came. I was chosen. A few moments, and we caught a huge tunny. A few blows on the head from a stick, and the animal, quivering in the death throes, lay twisting his body, now transformed into glinting spangles of innumerable sparks. A second time, we were fortunate. Decidedly, the Frenchman brought luck. They all shouted joyously that I was a fine fellow, and I, full of pride, did not say no. We fished till evening. When the supply of the small fish used as bait was exhausted, the sun was setting the horizon ablaze with red. We made ready to return. Ten magnificent tunies overloaded the pirogue. While all was being put straight, I asked a young boy why. All those laughs and whispers at the moment when my two tunies were brought aboard the pirogue. He refused to explain, but I insisted, knowing how little power of resistance a Maori has, how weak he is when pressed energetically. He then told me that a fish caught by the lower jaw means infidelity by your vahine while you are away fishing. <laughs> I smiled incredulously, and we returned. All our booty laid out on the sand. The captain cuts as many pieces, equal shares, as there were people engaged in the fishing, women and children as well, whether the main fishing or the fishing for the small fish, 37 shares. Immediately afterwards, my vahine took the ax, chopped wood, lit a fire, while I washed and put on some clothes against the coolness of the night. 
my share of the fish cooked, hers raw. Countless questions, the incidents of the fishing. Bedtime came. One question was gnawing at me. Oh, what was the good? At last I asked it. Have you been good? I ay. And was your lover today nice? I have no lover. You're lying. The fish has spoken. <laughs> Her face took on a look I had never seen before. Her brow expressed a prayer. In spite of myself, I went with her in her faith. There are moments when warnings from on high are useful. Contrast between the religious, superstitious faith of that race and the skepticism, and the skepticism of our civilization. Gently, she closed the door and prayed. Oh, my God. That evening, I prayed. Almost. Her prayer done. She drew near me, resigned, and said, with tears in her eyes, you must beat me, strike me hard. And before that resigned face, that marvelous body, I was reminded of some perfect idol. May my hands be forever accused if they scourged a masterpiece of creation. Naked like that, she seemed clothed in the orange-yellow garment of purity, the yellow mantle of Bishu, a beautiful golden flower whose Tahitian Noah Noah filled all with fragrance and which I worshipped as an artist, as a man. Beat me, I tell you, or you'll be angry for a long time and you'll be ill. I kissed her and my eyes spoke these words of Buddha. It is by gentleness that anger must be conquered, by good that evil must be conquered, by truth lying. That was a tropical night. Morning came, radiant. Mother-in-law brought us some fresh coconuts. She questioned Tehamana with a look. She knew. Suddenly, she said to me, you went fishing yesterday. Did all go well? I answered, I hope to go again very soon. I had to go back to France. Imperative family duties called me back. Goodbye, hospitable soil. I went away two years older, younger by 20 years, more of a barbarian too, and yet knowing more. When I left the jetty to go aboard, Tehamana, who had wept for several nights, tired, melancholy, I sat down on the stones. Her legs dangled, letting both her big sturdy feet brush the salt water. The flower she had been wearing over her ear had fallen into her lap, faded. Old Maori saying, you like breezes from the south and east who join together to play and to caress one another above my head, make haste and run all together to the other island. You will see the man who has left me as he sits in the shade of his favorite tree. Tell him you have seen me in tears. After the work of art, the truth. The dirty truth. Thanks for that. Thank you. <clears throat> so, 
Um, so I, I, I was reading, um, you know, selections from the text. Um, and uh, it's wonderful. And, you know, it's one of the early, early drafts of Gauguin's script. Um, Noah Noah, like Gauguin, is complicated. And uh, so there's a couple of versions. There's, uh, it was a collaboration with a, uh, um, he had a collaboration with a French poet, Charles Maurice. And there's a French version that has all of the poet's work and uh, Gauguin's collaboration. Um, it was an idea of Gauguin kind of doing this, this kind of, you know, his point of view and, and Maurice's kind of point of view. Some describe it as savage and civilized, poetic, I don't know. Um, and then there was a, uh, Maurice kind of got cut out of the picture after the 1921 uh, La Plume version. And then there was a, arrived, uh, this interest in just Gauguin. We just want to hear his text. Um, and so this was a selection from that. Um, uh, what can I say? So what am I doing here? <laughs> so <laughs> I had a, a wonderful invitation from, uh, from uh, the director of the fantastic Fondation Bayeleur here, um, Samuel Keller. Where are you, Samuel? Are you here still? Right now. Oh, there you are, sir. <laughs> in the future, in the present, and now. Um, and uh, he, I had an invitation to, uh, to read uh, Gauguin, Noah Noah, and I asked why. And uh, he said, you're Hawaiian. And I said, that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah then that makes sense. I had seen Gauguin's photos as a child, and of course had seen them growing up, mostly though uh, from books. Um, and uh, I was curious. And it's been really an honor and a pleasure, sir, to go on this journey to learn about this artist. And, uh, um, and to be in this place and to see his work collected here um, is absolutely extraordinary. Um, in pre preparation for this, uh, you know, I started to read some of the letters that Gauguin had written to his friends and, you know, to his wife and, and to, uh, well, not to his family. Um, and, uh, I mean, his life is so complicated. Um, and, uh, let's see, I hadn't figured this part out. <laughs> I was hoping that the passion would take me, but uh, <laughs> he suffered. You know, I think of the word Noah, Noah, and what that is. And I think of like when he describes it's with scent, and with that comes a kind of consciousness, a place. Um, and in that, I think of somehow. Uh, his passion, maybe his happiness. He's so intellectual, he's so emotive, he's brilliant, um, but he suffered. And I don't know how familiar you are with his biography, but it's, you know, I mean, just the, you know, he was described as being difficult and yet a great friend. Um, you know, he left his family, his wife, his five kids. He had other children. You know, I remember reading uh, a quote of his uh, from one of his letters to his friend, Monfried. And uh, he said, nothing matters but art. Not my wife, not my children. What a sentence. What a sentence. He left to Polynesia when he was, described me, when he was 43. Came back to Paris for a couple of years and worked with uh, Maurice and worked on this document. He sold all of his belongings or his estate three times in his life. And the third time he sold it and he went back again to Tahiti, eight years. And then he left Tahiti and he went to another island 800 miles away in the Marquesas, where he died at 55. <laughs> Alone. Um, but what he's left us which is uh, remarkable, remarkable, which we see in that collection of rooms, 
and these paintings that have come from all over the world, these for a hundred years, is to me uh, quite remarkable. It's a kind of question, a quest, a proposition, a seduction, a confrontation by an artist in a way to, this is Peter Doig, by the way, <laughs> with another story. But I don't know, I was so struck by, you know, it's, you know, this art, it's like, how do you like it? It's like such a confrontation. So much of the art looks at you looking at it. You know, that masterful work, you know, where are we from? What are we? Where are we going? That question for him and for us, for our Noah Noah, for what we leave behind, for what we want to find, for who we want to be. It is the most human thing. It's wonderful. And his art, I think, is uh, challenging and helping us and maybe to, uh, with the better, with the good, the bad, and hopefully we can all have some no one know us. So anyway, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you.